We're going to take a little bit of a journey this morning as we share as a family with our testimonies. Um, and I want to talk through in between and, and after we share as a church family about the, the Samaritan woman that Jesus meets in, at the well. Do you remember that story? Yeah. And it's incredible how it begins that the disciples and Jesus need to get to an, a, the next town, right? And all, not just some, but all the Jewish people, when they go to this other neighboring town, they never take the shortest route. Why don't they ever take the shortest route? Because it's through Samaria. And who lives in Samaria? Samaritans. Samaritans. And did, did they like each other very much back then? No. In fact, they were just an unclean people that a good Christian, I don't know if that was the right, a good Jewish believer because Christianity was still yet to be born. Christianity was born when Jesus rose, right? From that, was, that was when Christianity was born. So a good Jewish believer in, in the same God we worship today would never be seen talking to a Samaritan. But Jesus said, hmm, my disciples need to learn something. And he's speaking to us today. We need to learn something. And I'm going to take them right through town. And I'm going to mess with them. And I, right? I'm going to teach them something. And Christ is working on all of us every day, just trying to teach us something so we can be what? Closer to him. So we just can be a little closer to him. And as we draw closer to him, we get to see him more clearly and we learn to love better as we get closer to him. We get to, to worship better and we get to have better relationships with each other as we get closer to Jesus. Can we say a prayer real quick as we get started here sharing our testimonies? Dear Jesus, oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the message of slowing down so that, so that we can be here listening for your voice. If prayer is talking to you, then you talking to us is, is our conscious and that still small voice that we need to quiet down a bit so that we can really hear it. And I just pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you send your Holy Spirit here for us so that we can see you more clearly. And thank you, thank you for being here. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to start off with something that I think we, we, we believe. This is a little bit disturbing, Tyler. <laughs> I don't know if you can see this. It's, it's a picture of Tyler, and he's really thinking hard there. I want to, sorry, I uh, got distracted. I want to start off with, some, with a, a testimony from one of our own family who, who holds up prayer in a powerful way for all of us. And there's some really beautiful stories that, that Tamara has uh, that, that she's experienced through the leadership, of, or she heads up our prayer team. That, uh, uh, and is there anything more powerful that we can do as Christians than pray to our God? There's not, I don't think. I think, I, I think that unleashes God's will in our lives and in our world and in our families. So Tamara, would you, would you please come up and share? All the glory to God. I'm not here for me. I'm here for God. And uh, I just want to say a prayer because I'm shaking in my boots. <laughs> Our dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you as a family. 
uh, to share the love and joy of God. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be upon each of us that stand up here to share, and that our words would be your words and not ours. Thank you, Lord, for your presence and your love and your power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to start off by reading a scripture, Ephesians 3.20, because it's very powerful and very big, and prayer is powerful and big. Amen. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Isn't that big? It's big. God is big. God is good. God is mighty to save and everything in between. You've heard the expression, the power of prayer. How many of you heard that expression, the power of prayer? Okay, it's very common. Well, I'm going to tell you, I don't believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the power of the living God experienced through prayer. That's where the power comes from is God, not through prayer. Not through a thing, but through who he is. Here's a few quotes to think on. Prayer is not a part of the work. It is the most important work. When we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. Prayer moves heaven. That is big. How many of you think that's big? That's big. When we pray, it moves heaven. When we choose him, then he will work in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. That's Denny's favorite scripture, but it's absolutely true. (laughs) God has revealed to me a lot of answers to prayers. However, most prayers I may never know the answer to this side of heaven. Some prayers need a one-time answer, while others need ongoing answers. Some prayers are answered immediately, while some answers come after a long season of prayer. It's all in God's perfect timing, and he's never late. Here are a few answers God has graciously revealed to me And these are for salvation, healing, provision, protection, and guidance. Each revelation of answered prayer has brought me great joy, increased my faith in God, and brought me closer to him. I hope that as I share these with you, you will experience and be encouraged to keep praying, increase your faith, and walk closer to God. I'm nervous. I got a drink. (laughs) All of this is for God's glory. There's a prayer of salvation that I want to share with you, and I'll try to be brief because it's long, but I'll try to be brief. It's the story of the salvation of my dad. And to me, it was the greatest, one of the greatest pinnacles of my walk with God. Uh, I was brought up in a non-Christian home. I was the only Christian out of seven. At the age of 10, a neighbor knocked on my door and said, I want to invite you to go to church. My mom agreed, thankfully. So I attended the Baptist church, and I, through a year of attending and, and Going to Sunday school, uh, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And from that point on, I started praying for my parents. One, that they would stop smoking, and two, that they would find Jesus as Savior. Because the experience that I had with God, even at such a young age and even at such a, a preliminary state, I knew that they needed him. 
So the years go by and I pray on and off and I'm in and out of relationship with Jesus myself. And, um, but it's always just a deep burning desire that my parents be saved. And so go through life and I, I, as a teenager, I'm attending a Presbyterian church and really involved and, and then I get married, move away and God speaks to me and gives me a desire to seek a church that teaches the word of God. And he led me uh, to the Adventist church. So all through these years, I've been praying and have a desire for my parents to be saved. So I see my parents every once in a while, and I don't always have opportunity to actually say something to them, but they know I'm a Christian, and they know I walk with God. So um, once in a while, I'll have a conversation with my dad. He brings it up, and it's usually in criticism of my Seventh-day Adventist faith. But I listen and I respect his view, uh, even though, and sometimes it hurts me uh, to have him say that. So now that's kind of a little background. My dad, when he was in his 20s, had a really good friend. His name was Bill True. Is, is Bill True. Bill True is still alive, praise the Lord. Through Bill's life, he comes to know the Lord as his savior. And him and my dad were like rebel rousers when they were in their 20s. So it's a great thing that he comes to the Lord. So every opportunity Bill has to speak to my dad, he brings God up or is a witness to him in some form or another. So above all, God is working in my dad's life. I don't know the whole story. God does, and someday I will. Uh, but God is interjecting uh, people and thoughts and the Holy Spirit into my dad's life without me knowing it. And I moved to Washougal, and I'm a, a nanny for a family. This is really going to sound strange. God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> I'm soaking in the bathtub, and I'm thinking about God and the relationship and how my, lots of things. And God puts on my heart and in my head, I need to write a letter to my dad. And he starts putting all these thoughts in my head, what to write in this letter, and they're just like going boom, 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 boom. And I'm going, I don't have pen and paper, right? <laughs> But I said, God, if this is something you want me to remember, to write to my dad, help me to remember it. And he did. So I, when I got out of the tub, I wrote this three or four page letter to my dad. Basically, it was, you know, telling my dad my great desire for him to know Jesus as a savior and knowing that he wasn't always in agreement with my Sabbath keeping but I did, wasn't concerned about that because I wanted him to know Jesus as Savior. I also told my dad that as he, um, as being my father, he taught me obedience. And by him teaching me obedience, it taught me how to obey God. So um, I send off this letter. And I don't hear anything about it. But I go to see uh, Dad the next time, and he said, thank you for the letter. He says, I've been thinking about that, and I read it a lot. I go, praise God. I'm... God is using that little tool to, to speak to my dad. So uh, my dad has emphysema by this time. He's on oxygen all the time. He can't hardly walk from his chair to the bathroom without stopping to breathe. My dad's had emphysema and COPD for 20 years by that time. And um, I 
He has, uh, actually, I think he's on hospice at that time because the hospice um, uh, manager, whatever, is a pastor. And um, one day this pastor, he comes, he comes and brings oxygen and he talks to dad and he, you know, just checks on him and just sees how he is because that's part of his job job. So one day he shows up uh, to my dad's and my dad hands him the letter. And he says, tell me what you think of this. I'm going to cry. That's why I brought tissue. <laughs> and um, the pastor reads the letter that I wrote. And he says, well, I think you have a decision to make. Mm. And um, my dad says, yes, I do. Mm. I'm crying out of joy. Amen. <laughs> because they kneel on the living room floor right there. My dad starts crying. And I don't know all the details of what happened, and I only know about this because of a letter that the pastor wrote to me. And uh, my dad accepts Jesus as his savior. Amen. And I'm saying, hallelujah, mm. hallelujah. Mm. And, um, Fourteen months later, my dad passes away, but he passes away sleeping in Jesus. Amen. And he'll raise again someday, and he'll be with me in Amen. heaven. Amen. I'm so happy. Sorry. <laughs> no. Don't be sorry. That's the good news. It is. It's the best news. Mm -hmm. it is. Amen. It is. So... So God works in lots of ways, and in ways we don't see, praise him. He sees the big picture, and he's almighty. And uh, so in the meantime, I'm still praying for my mom. <laughs> my mom is uh, devastated in grief over the loss of my dad, and she just kind of gives up. She's depressed. She doesn't want to eat. She has a friend that steps up to the plate and comes to the house. He brings her food and he sits there with her and eats food with her to make sure she's going to eat. Anyway, so my mom gets out of her uh, depressive slump after about six months and she's living life and being my joyful, loving mom with a heart of gold. My mom was very social, and she'd invite the whole town over for a fish fry, and they'd have music, and just sit around and visit, and my mom was like that. And I want my mom in heaven, too. So uh, my mom's diagnosed with lung cancer, and uh, shortly after my dad has passed, and uh, I call her up all the time, and I say, Mom, I'm praying for you. She goes, thank you. And I send her cards and whatever I have to say, and then at the end I say, I'm praying for you. She doesn't know what I'm praying for. She assumes I'm praying for her cancer and to get well. But I'm praying for her to be saved. Amen. So um, my mom passes away, and I'm thinking, I don't know if she's saved. At the funeral, the pastor who had been with my dad when he was saved, he does the sermon or the service for my mom's funeral. And uh, we chat afterwards, and he says, uh, he, he knows that I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and what I believe, and that we believe that people are asleep 
after they die when others believe that they rise again and go to heaven or whatever. So anyway, um, he says, well, I um, talked to your mom on the phone and she wanted to meet with me the following week after she prayed, uh, after she died. And so I'm going, well, that's probably when she was probably going to accept Jesus, but I don't know. So time goes on, and we all get into our lives again. And I start seeing my sister every year when I make a trip to eastern Oregon. And this one time, the Lord put it on my heart that I needed to apologize to my sister for something that I blamed her for when we were children. And so late at night with the lights out, that's when you're the bravest, isn't it? We're laying in bed and I start crying and I tell her I have to apologize to you for this incident. And she goes, I didn't even know it. I didn't even remember it. She says, you don't have to apologize. I said, yes, I do. Because I blamed you for something I did wrong. So anyway. During that conversation, I said, do you believe in heaven? Do you believe in salvation? She goes, yeah. I said, do you ever think you'll be saved someday? Oh, someday. I said, oh, well, I sure wished I knew if mom was saved. She said, she is. I just about jumped out of that bed, and I said, how do you know? She said because a week before she passed, she, had the, she met with the pastor, and she accepted Jesus as her Savior. Hallelujah! <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Prayers answered. And he, she, I says, well, she had an appointment to meet him the week after she died. She goes, yeah, because she wanted to know more. She wanted to know more. So I'm so thankful so thankful that God revealed to me those answers because it gave me such great joy, such great joy to know that my parents will be in heaven with me. Amen. Now I'm working on the brothers and sisters. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been working on them. Glory to God. Glory to God. He is mighty to save. Amen. The next... Uh, answer to prayer that was revealed to me. I'm, these are just touching, these are little drops in the bucket. I mean, I hear of prayers being answered all the time. I pray a lot for a lot of you. And a lot of you don't know each other's things that are need prayer for, but I do because you call me and you send notes and you email and all this. And so we're praying for all of you. But there are certain things that stand out when God reveals prayer. And there are so many stories I could say, but I had to narrow it down. Even <laughs> now, I think I'm taking too long anyway. A prayer of healing. There is a little girl right here in our con congregation today who is alive and well because of the power of God. Amen. Her name is Evelyn Hargrave. The little three-year-old girl we prayed for last year. She has a bad heart condition and she's had surgeries and she needed more surgeries. And the doctors were gonna put surgery off for a whole year, a whole year. And to us, this this needed immediate attention. They came forward for prayer. They have three children. Evelyn's the middle one. Is that right, Tina? Where'd she go? Oh, okay. They're out there in the mother's room, <laughs> of course. So they all came up here. We all gathered, well, several of us gathered up front to pray over them. And I continued to pray for them even after leaving the front. And our prayer team on Thursday nights prayed for them uh, once a week. 
and lots of other people were praying in between too. And she ended up having surgery shortly after that. Okay. Instead of waiting a whole year, they gave her surgery within a short period of time after that prayer. And little Evelyn is alive and well today because of that. Amen. God intervened Amen. and wanted this healing. And I praise him and I give him glory. Our God is mighty to heal. There's another one I was going to tell you about, but I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> um, well, no, I won't, because I, I don't have the whole story, but a lot of you know Roy Charbonneau, and you know a lot of the heart trouble that he's had in the last several years. And there was a point when they came up front, and he was scheduled to have surgery, and they just prayed, and he was anointed that he would um, survive this uh, surgery. As it turned out, he didn't need the surgery at that time. And we were saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And Roy is still up and going. Nice. So we're so thankful for that. The next one is prayer of provision. Oh, you guys are just going to die for this. <laughs> I hope I, ha I don't, it's been a long time since this story happened, since this prayer was revealed and a lot of the details, but I think I know enough that I can relay this, but it was, it's made such an impression on me. We're having church just like this, and the pastor says anyone who needs special prayer come up front after the service. I'm standing up here, and this strange lady comes up. It happens now and then. A stranger, I don't know, comes up front. They tell me their prayer request. This lady comes up, and she says, Please pray that I find my wallet. She says, I'm up here visiting family. I live, I think it was in Wisconsin, and I'm boarding a plane in the morning and I have to have my wallet because it has my ID and all my travel papers and da 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 da. She can't go home, go fly and go home without this wallet. So we prayed right then and I assure her that we can trust God to answer this prayer. So she leaves. That's the last I see of her. I don't know if she's found the wallet or not, but I'm trusting in God that she does. And I prayed for her many, many times, even after leaving this church that day, because it was an urgent timeline prayer. Months later, months later, she emails the church. The church passes the email on to me. Do you know this lady? And I had forgotten her name, but then she starts telling me the story. And I'm going, oh, wow, she was the lady that came up front here asking for prayer. And she said, when she was up here asking for prayer, she says, I have looked everywhere over and over again, and I can't find my wallet. Well, in the email, I wished I had it with me, but anyway, I couldn't find it. She said, I went home and I looked everywhere again and I kept praying. And the next morning, when it was time to go to the airport, she was looking again and just trusting in God. And right there on the step where all of her bags were, her wallet was right on top. And she was ready to go. God is never late. <laughs> we may be frantic and we may be wondering and we may be all in a tizzy about answering our, our prayers, but God is never late. Amen. God cares about everything that goes on in our lives. Not just salvation, not just healing, but little things. I can't tell you how many people have asked me to say, please pray that God will get, show, show me where my keys are. Keys. Keys. We have lots of prayers for keys. <laughs> God cares even about the little things. This next one is a prayer of guidance for a child. Now, I can't mention names here because this is all in confidentiality. 
that I can tell you enough to have you um, understand the importance of this. So I've known this family since I've been coming to this church. And uh, uh, there was a period of time when the little boy was, I don't know, five or six, seven. And he started doubting his relationship with God and uh, expressing that to his mom. His mom came to prayer room and said, we've got to pray for this boy. I said, you bet we do. So we prayed. And his faith came back. And time goes on. This is a very um, loving family who's close to God. They have morning and night devotions. They're living out their faith. The boys can't help but know God. So then the boy drifts away, and we pray some more, and he comes back. Right now, he's an older teenage boy, and he's drifting away again. So we're on the prayer wagon again for this boy, that his faith will grow strong, and he'll come back to God. So that's one of those prayers that is an ongoing thing. And finally, prayer of protection. And I hope I do this justice. <laughs> because I've heard other people tell it a lot better than I do. Okay, so our prayer team meets every Thursday over there. We pray for this church. We pray for the school. We pray for the people individually. We pray for our students. We pray for um, volunteers, parents. Um, the pastors, uh, the leaders of the ministries. I mean, you're all covered. One specific prayer that has been prayed for the last, I, I don't know how many years, <laughs> 10. I think I've been prayer ministry leader for 10 plus years. And it's not my prayer. It's not something I have specifically said, but I'll relay it to you. It goes like this. Dear Lord, please post your angels at the four corners of this campus. Build a wall of protection around this church and this school with your angels. With fiery swords and assign an angel to each student who is t attending here so that they may know about Jesus and their academics. Okay, keep that prayer in mind. God revealed the answer very specifically recently. We don't only pray that prayer over there in the fellowship hall once a week. We take that prayer home with us and pray it all through the week so that you're all covered through the week. It's not because we are praying, it's because we serve a mighty God who answers the prayers. So recently it was revealed that a student who uh, was going home with his mom one night after school in the car, she says, well, how did your day go? And I don't know if this is verbatim, but this is the story I heard. So if the people are present here, uh, forgive me if I don't get it exactly right, but you'll get the idea. And he says, Mom, the angels are here. She says, well, the angels are always with you wherever you go. He said, no, I feel the angels are here with me. He's an individual student <clears throat> who feels the angels here. He knows God is here because his angels are here, watching over them, protecting them. 
You know, we have a fence out here that most of the property is fenced in, but I'm not sure about that hill. And it's secluded and you never know, you know. So we want that protected. We don't want anyone, any harm or any evil coming on this place to harm our students. Amen. <clears throat> Those are a few of the revealed prayers. I could talk all day. She can, <laughs> can't she? <laughs> Amen. This is our sister praying for us. Thank you. I have a couple other things to say and then close with the scripture. Okay. Okay. Sorry. No. <laughs> Don't let me rush you. <laughs> Absolutely. So the prayer of protection, I always refer to Psalms 91. The whole chapter is about protecting in different situations, but Linda just hit it right on the head today with verses 5 and 6. And I want to read that again. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Now, you know, it's not just praying for the students that they do well in school and everything goes fine. We pray for their health, too, because we know in schools, the flu and the colds, they go around like crazy. So when we hear of one person that's, that's sick, we start praying and we continue to pray. Uh, for their health. So that talks about the pestilence and the uh, plague. So we rely on God for his protection for that too. That young man we're praying for to come back to God. John 10, 27 through 29 is the scripture that I want to read that I'm claiming for him, because I claim it for my daughter too, for her to come back. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. When I pray for my daughter to come back to God, and when I pray for others, when I know that the trials are strong for our children, I say, Lord, let nothing and no one snatch them out of your hands. Here is a couple of things to think on. Prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse. Mm. That storehouse has blessings, but that storehouse has um, healing and guidance. The storehouse is God. Watch and pray. Watch for people around you who need prayer and pray. Amen. I want to close again with Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Let's say a prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being our mighty God who loves us and cares about us and wants us to be with you. Work in our lives, hear and answer our prayers, not for us, but for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank, Thank you, you for bearing Thank with you. me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, 
God has instructed us that good worship has testimony as part of that. He's requested, and, and um, I'm going to cut short just my conversation about the woman at the well here because it's time to, to, to move on. We're so thankful for your testimonies, for your prayers. Uh, don't feel sorry at all because we're going to hopefully have more services, and this is a, this is a beautiful example that we need to do this more often because she's got something to say, right? Amen? And, and I also have another dream. Have you ever been to a ball game that you love, you follow the team, you're excited about the team, and they make a touchdown, or they score a basket, or they win? What happens? You cheer. How loud do you cheer? It's crazy sometimes, right? It's off the hook. It gets, it's like, it's like the groupies that follow third degree burn, and they, they, they got a performance, and everybody's screaming, right? Her father was saved. What? Her father was saved. Her father was saved. That's, that's the victory. That's the win. That's, that's, that's why we're here, to support each other. And the more that we can share our stories, see our vulnerabilities, and, and some of the folks that I was going to have say testimonies today, save those, we'll have those again. Jesus, uh, with with this woman at the well has a moment with her, right? One-on-one. -on -one. She, here's what it says in John chapter 4, verse 39. Many, because this woman, and was this woman worthy to be a disciple, would you think? Was this woman uh, the town mayor? Was this woman of the pure of heart? Was this woman someone when she spoke, people listened? Did, was she maybe one of the less, lessers that would be within the community? But she spent some time with Jesus and she believed and she went away. In verse 39, John chapter 4, John, John recounts this, that many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus Many Samaritans believed in Jesus because of what the woman had said. People, it's our testimony. The, the Gospels were written after thousands of people were saved. It was the testimonies. It was the personal stories. It was the personal struggles. It was the personal challenges. And it was the personal victories that the disciples went out and started preaching, right? You have a story. You may think it's not so big. Uh, Tyler was going to share a story today. His story, he was, he was asking, hey, it doesn't seem like much. Whoa, that's huge because that's your story. It's not my story. It's your story. And Tyler, I love you. You've got a great story. Each of you have a great story that, that God is working in us. So I'm going to say a prayer real quick, and we're going to get on out of here and have some food that feeds our, our physical body. And thank you, Tamara, for sharing, and thank you for the prayer team for praying for us. God says where two or more are gathered, so you've doubled that. You've got four. Dear Father, thank you for answering our prayers. Thank you for giving us a story. Help us to see it more clearly. And give us the strength. Give us the passion. Give us the desire. And give us the wisdom and the will that when we come across a situation where that story can make a difference, to share it. To share it with each other. To share it with the world. To share it at school. To share it at work. To share it on the bus. To share it where we feel you guiding and moving us. And then we just pray that your spirit gives us wisdom through those conversations. And we give this all to you and thank you for this family. And as we, as we grow together deeper in you, in Jesus' name, amen.